Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes to let uh, the last few people join and then we will get started. Okay, I think that is everyone on the call. So thank you all for joining us this evening. So welcome to this webinar uh, hosted by the Mammal Society, all about owl pellet dissections. Um, my name is Fiona, I'm the Education and Training Officer for the Mammal Society. Uh, and on the webinar with us this evening, we also have Ross, who is our Science and Research Officer. And then we have Tony. Um, Tony is one of our uh, trainers. He's also a member of our council and he's going to be uh, talking us through all of the important stuff to do with owl pellet dissections. Just before we get on to that, just a little bit of housekeeping. So this webinar is being recorded um, and you'll be sent a copy of the recording afterwards. You should have access to the Q&A feature. So if you've got any questions as you're going through, do pop them in there and we will have time to ask them at the end. Um, and I just wanted to give you a, a very brief introduction to the Mammal Society. So for those of you who don't know, know us, we um, were established 70 years ago, so in 1954. And the Mammal Society is dedicated to the monitoring, study and conservation of mammals across the British Isles. So we run a number of different monitoring projects, a number of different citizen science projects, and this uh, webinar is all about one of those. And you can see on the screen now our mission, and I won't read that one to you, but I'll just give you a chance to have a quick look at that as well. And I just wanted to, to make you aware of a couple of the other things that we do. So if you don't already have the Mammal Mapper app, that's available um, on the App Store and on Google Play. Uh, a Mammal Mapper is a great way for you to record any signs or sightings of mammals that you see around the UK. It's also got a really good ID guide and lots of helpful information on there as well. And it's a free app that you can install. The Mammal Society also run a number of different training courses. Um, they are all bookable on Eventbrite. We have lots of different things from full day courses, weekend courses, online webinars, um, covering all topics to do with mammals. Um, and I will pop a link to, to all of the things that I'm talking about in the chat box as well. Um, and our next webinar is coming up at the end of the month and it is all about uh, obscure bones of the mammal skeleton. So that one might be of interest to you. We also every year run a, a conference and this year we're in Cambridge from the 12th to the 14th of April. Uh, and as this is our 70th year, the theme is all about looking to the past and looking to the future of mammal science and conservation. Uh, and there are tickets available for the weekend or for one of the days or for um, a range of different workshops happening in Cambridge and around the UK on the Sunday. So we've got lots and lots going on there as well. And finally, if you're not already a member of the Mammal Society, um, it's really, really easy to sign up and it's just £5 a month. Uh, and you get our quarterly mammal news magazine, you get discounts on all of our trainings and events, and you have the opportunity to steer our work. So if you're interested in that, do have a look at our website as well. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Ross now, who is going to talk to us a little bit about the Searching for Shoes project and about why we are uh, interested in our pellet dissections. So I'll hand over to Ross now. Thank you very much. Thanks. So um, I think the... Um... Yeah, I'd like to start with a little bit of background on the um, the Greater White Tooth Shrew um, and why we're interested in it. Um, so the the discovery of the um, of, of the Greater White Tooth Shrew in Sunderland um, about a year and a half ago um, marked quite a significant event um, as it became the first new mammal that was that was recorded. Well, the first new mammal species that recorded in the country in about a century. Um, so this species, which is native to Europe. Um, and the Channel Islands and North Africa was first confirmed in Great Britain um, through a DNA analysis um, after a cat owner in Sunderland found a uh, 
or was was brought a deceased shrew um, through the through the cat flap. Um, and its arrival in Great Britain has raised concerns among ecologists due to its invasive nature, which was observed in Ireland, um, where it's completely outcompeted the native pygmy shrew, um, leading to um, the, la the latter's local disappearance. Um, so essentially anywhere where the greater white tooth shrew was found, um, there were no pygmy shrews there anymore. Um, and its ability to outcompete other shrew species for resources could lead to a si similar um, ecological shifts in Great Britain, um, although uh, the specific impacts are, are not currently fully understood. Um, there are some fundamental differences in the ecosystems between um, Ireland and Great Britain. Um, so that kind of suggests that the outcome of the greater white tooth shrew's introduction or invasion almost um, might vary with Ireland, um, which really emphasizes the need for, for thorough research to assess its um, its distribution and the potential impacts it might have on our native small mammal communities. Uh, and this situation, um, it, it, it really highlights the importance of monitoring invasive species um, and the role of citizen science in detecting and reporting non-native species. And we hope that by encouraging public participation um, in reporting sightings of unusual shrews or um, or other mammals, of course, um, that these can aid in the tracking of this um, invasive species. Um, and also, um, eventually, ho hopefully, it will help implement measures to protect native wildlife as well. So um, why owl pellets? Um, I think it was so it was really by prioritizing the kind of ethical and practical considerations that led us to choose um, the use of owl pellet dissection for this project. Um, this method is inherently non-invasive. Um, it ensures minimal disturbance to the animals involved uh, by kind of avoiding direct contact with them, as you might have if you were um, doing kind of trapping um, where you would, you know, you'd, you potentially have to handle the animals as well. Um, and the owl pellets that we send out to volunteers are collected by licensed bird ringers who go through a really strict process to get their license, um, which ensures that they're they're able to work closely with um, the, the owls um, while, uh, you know, minimizing the amount of disturbance that they cause. Um, but there are also a few other advantages of using barn owl pellets specifically. Um, they, the barn owl is, uh, is a really highly efficient predator um, and it focuses on small mammals, um, maybe amphibians as well, um, but certainly small mammals are in its diet. Um, and we're really confident um, that they're able to catch the greater white tooth shrew. Um, so we've already found some, some greater white tooth shrew remains in, in barn owl pellets already. Um, we also know that barn owls have relatively weak stomach acid compared to other raptors. So the bones of their prey remain reasonably well, un, like, you know, they're not damaged by the stomach acid. And so that means um, the small, uh, the small kind of distinguishing features are, are much easier to identify. And these, these distinguishing features can be, can be really quite subtle. Um, uh, but that, Perhaps the most important reason that we've chosen this method uh, is because of how accessible it is. So there's no there's no need to go stand in a rainy field um, for hours and hours, um, uh, getting muddy and, and, and wet. Um, and you don't need to have years of, of training in survey techniques and, you know, handling small mammals and, and things like that. Um, so we really think that people of all ages and of all backgrounds will be able to get involved with this project. Uh, we also have a volunteer pack, um, which uh, it will be sent out with pellets, um, uh, and it includes all of the information that, that volunteers need to get started. Um, I think uh, Fiona is going to speak a little bit about that later on and show you some pictures of, of some of the resources that we have. Um, and then finally, I wanted to talk a bit about the outcomes we expect from this project. Um, so it's important to say that the locations where the owl pellets are collected are also recorded. Um, so once the owl pellets have been dissected, what we'll have is per location, a list of species, but also the number of species that we've found. So we'll have an idea of what the kind of community structure looks like in those locations. 
And then from this, uh, we'll be able to see how the Greater White Tooth Shrew is doing. Of course, we'll have, uh, uh, you know, barn owl pellets will be collected from a, over the entire country. So wherever the Greater White Tooth Shrew shows up, we'll, we'll kind of have an indication of, of where its range currently sits. Um, we'll be able to see whether the, the range of the Greater White Tooth Shrew is expanding or not, as the case may be. Um, and as this project continues, we'll also be able to see uh, the rate at which that change is, is, is happening, how, how quickly it's able to colonize new areas as well. Um, and alongside uh, kind of, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have kind of habitat and climate data involved um, later on, um, we'll be able to hopefully see which, you know, what kind of factors um, might be influencing how quickly the, uh, the the shrew is able to to expand its range, um, or things, of course, that might slow down its its range expansion, um, like motorways and things like that. Um, so, if we do find that the greater white tooth shrew's range is expanding and starting to cross over with um, the you know the ranges of other small mammal species. Um, we'll also expect to see how its presence changes the structure of native communities, if it if it changes them. This is all unknown at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier on in, in Ireland, it's completely decimated the pygmy shrew populations. And, and of course, we're really keen to stop that from happening on Great Britain. Um, and, and I think that given there, there are kind of fundamental differences between the ecosystems in Ireland and, and Great Britain, there's a, you know, it's very difficult to say exactly what the effect will be. Um, so this, um, this, uh, this research really is is hoping to answer that question, and um, and I think you know, answering all of these questions and 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 if we when we get all of these outcomes, I think it will really help us to mitigate any kind of detrimental effects that the greater white tooth shrew has. Um, uh, it'll help us produce some actionable insights that we can kind of that we can use to help inform conservationists around the country um, and, uh, you know, and um, and really kind of try and uh, make the best out of what could become a, a pretty, a pretty dire situation for our native mammals. Well, thank you very much. I'll pass you back to Fiona. Brilliant. Thank you, Ross. So hopefully that's given you all a little bit of a background as to, to why we're interested in, in our pellets, particularly uh, for a mammal charity. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Tony now, who is going to show you a little bit more about how you dissect an owl pellet uh, and tell you a little bit more about their formation and the kind of things that you might find. So I will hand over now. Okay, thanks, Fiona. I'll just start initially with a brief introduction to owl pellet, uh, pellets as a whole, basically, because as you're probably aware, any bird that eats live prey is likely to produce a pellet of some description. So this is just an introduction to the various pellet types you're likely to come across. So say this is just an introduction to the various types of pellet you're likely to find and what they contain and where, well, basically where to look for them. Start with a bit of anatomy. A bird's stomach is basically divided into two sections. There's the, what's called the glandular stomach, which is around about here, and the gizzard. And the gizzard is where indigestible items of food are gathered. And event, this is compacted into a bowl, and eventually when it reaches a suitable size, it is the bird actually coughs, coughs it up as a pellet. Basically, your fresh pellets are covered in mucus. Basically, it eases passage through the gullet and it helps keep the pellet together until it's sort of regurgitated. And obviously, the size of the gullet of the bird will de determine the size of a pellet. So obviously, a large bird like a heron will produce quite a large pellet, whereas something like a kingfisher, it's very small and, very, and almost very difficult to see. Shape of pellets also varies. Some are spherical, others are cylindrical, and they may have one end, one or both ends pointed. The consistency of the pellet also depends on the diet. 
So it may be firm, as in our pellets, or it may just fall apart pretty easily, as in other, some other species. They're mainly found at roosts or nesting and feeding feeding sites, but you can find them anywhere if you sort of just, you know, you will come across random pellets from time to time. Our pellets are the ones most people know about. These are the most useful because basically, as Ross said, owls swallow their prey whole and their digestive juices aren't particularly strong. So they, so they generally can consist of lots of matted fur and the bones are almost intact. You will however find that the skull may be crushed because basically owl, owls kill their prey with the back to the back of the neck. So don't be surprised if you find a skull and the back's disappeared. That's probably where the, like how that's happened. And generally they'll contain bones, fur, feathers, and also chitin from the exoskeletons of insects and other, you might get bones from things like frogs and various other small, small vertebrates. The tony owl, which is our commonest species, they mainly cat their pellets are about four or six centimeters long. They're often pointed at one end, and they're mainly found sort of near nests or favoured roof sites. They mainly consist of mice and small birds, but during the breeding season, they will actually catch larger larger prey. They'll actually catch things the size of pigeons. So don't be surprised if you get some large bird bones in tony owls. Barn owl is sort of the one that seems to be most useful because they tend to feed more, most entirely on mammals. It's rounded at both ends and it usually has this grey, smooth appearance. It's usually found on nest sites around barns and abandoned aerials, areas, especially in rural areas. The little owl is mainly an insect feeder, especially during the breeding season. So the pellet can have a sort of blue-black colour because it's probably mainly consists of remains of beetles. The rest of the year, the pellets are a greyish colour because it contains the remains of mice and small birds. Sometimes you can confuse little owl pellets with hedgehog droppings. Just be aware of that. But the main thing to bear in mind is that owl pellets don't have scent. Droppings tend to smell various, you know, various degrees so if you if you sort of find what looks like a, a pellet and you give it a sniff and it smells then go and wash your hands basically raptors you think produce useful pellets unfortunately a lot of them don't pr pr eat their prey whole they'll actually pick out small pieces and swallow them and often they'll decapitate the prey so the skull very rarely will appear in an out in a raptor pellet. They mainly sort of consist of fur because the ra ju digestive juices of raptors are pretty strong. So a lot of the bones will have been completely dissolved. So a lot, so a lot of what you get is a lot, lot of matted fur with just little bone fragments or bits of insects inside. Kestrel is one you're most likely to find. It's a, it's, it's pointed at one end, rounded at the other. It can look a bit like fox droppings at certain times of the year, so just be aware of that. You can find them almost anywhere, but mainly sort of around nesting and roost, roosting sites. The other one you're most likely to come across is the buzzard, which is a large pellet. You know, it can be up to seven or eight centimetres long, but it basically just consists of fur from small rodents, usually found in fields because these things tend to feed out in open country. And you will find lots of insect remains as well and various bits of earthworm and what have you. The sparrowhawk is almost always found in woodland and contains mainly bits of birds. It's mainly a mass of small feathers and small bird bones. Grey heron, it basically produces a large pellet. It's probably the largest you're likely to come across. The best place to look is under trees in a heronry during the breeding season. It's basically a mass of dense matted material, usually from small rodents such as field and water voles, perhaps you have mice. Interestingly, you very 
rarely find any traces of fish, even though they are the sort of main components of a grey heron diet. Whereas the cormorants will actually produce can pellets which just contain fish bones and scales. Again, this is mainly found around nesting and roosting sites. Gulls produce a variety of pellets depending on where they're feeding and what the and what the time of the year. They're generally very variable in shape, and the con and the content, as I say, varies depending on where the bird's feeding. And it's, so, generally, they they contain no because they don't contain any hair or feathers. They're generally just loose masses of bones. I say those near the coast. It's mainly you'll mainly find fish bones, bits of shellfish, crabs. And these sort of tend to fall apart very easily. This is the sort of thing you're looking for. This is a herring gull. Inland, you'll find they tend to be mainly plant material and insect remains. So this sort of a black-headed gull pellet at the bottom here. Sort of, they, so they tend to sort of held together slightly better. And those that feed at landfill sites, well, you can find almost anything in those. You know, ranging from rubber bands, bits of plastic and various other things. So, yeah. Crows, these produce elliptical or egg shapes, mainly plant matters, plant matter and insect remains. Contacts, contents vary seasonally. So in summer, it's mainly vegetable remains such as grain, stones and insects. You will find bits of feathers and carrion, depending on... What I say, what they've been feeding. Generally, the pellets norm are normally sort of yellowish in colour, and they do tend to fall apart very easily. Although they can be slightly darker and firmer if the bird has been feeding on some small mammals or carrion. You also find occasional small stones in our pellet in crow pellets. Basically, they they ingest small stones to grind up food in the gizzard. So obviously, they'll be sort of regurgitated as well. So they find a kingfisher, which is say, says the size of a large peanut, mainly of individual fish scales and fine bones. So you very rarely find these unless you know where a sort of kingfisher's feeding regularly. So, you know, if you're lucky, you, know, you might find one of these, but I say it's not one I've ever come across. And so I'll stop sharing there. And if... if anybody's got any questions or comments, do we leave them after till the end or do you want to do them now? Uh, I think if we keep going for now and if, if people can keep popping their questions in the Q&A, we'll, we'll do them at the end. Right, that's fair enough. Right, here's the fun bit. A quick demo of how to dissect a pellet. You can use various bits and pieces for this. I tend to use forceps, mounted needles, or cocktail sticks if you're on a budget. Basically, I tend to sort of dissect, normally I'll dissect them wet, basically in a tray full of water, which basically keeps the sort of dust down and sort of bits to of things don't go all over the place but this is a sort of quick way of doing it you just, you just have a your pellet and basically you just break it up and sort of hopefully you'll come across a few useful bones i tend to go for the sort of skulls first because they're the most useful when it comes to identifying identifying what you're looking for and here we have a sort of don't know if you can see that it's a jawbone of a small rodent so sort of using the tweezers or your mounted needle try and remove as much of the fur as possible try to keep it in one place obviously if it's if you do it in water it's sort of not slightly less messy than this so basically it's just a matter of keep breaking up the pellet so you can sort of find any other bits of the skull don't be surprised if you don't find more 
than one because sometimes these pellets you know, can can contain several bits of several animals sometimes three or four sometimes you might just get fractions of just one or two don't be surprised if the the contents fall apart fall apart while you're doing them as well because sometimes you know it's only the fur of fur in the pellets that's holding these things together you can see there we've got two more skulls obviously which are probably most likely rodent and then somewhere in here you'll find other bits And here we have a sort of that's a small skull from from the size and shape could be a shrew, but we'll know sort of when we've removed most of the fur. Yes, we have a sort of skull of a shrew, but not the one we're after, unfortunately. I say, white tooth shrew do, do, as the name suggests, do have white teeth, whereas our native shrews, the teeth are tipped with red, which is enamel, which is reinforced with iron, which basically keeps the tooth in better condition. Although, it will, obviously, this will wear away with age. But looking at the teeth of this with my magnifying glass, which is useful still to have, it does have red tips to the teeth, so it's obviously one of our common, our common native species. You can also see various bits of limb bones, which you can sort of extract. There will be sort of... This is where, because of tweezers coming handy, that's a sort of, where you can see that, that's a typical a rib bone from one of these small mammals. You'll find lots of those. Here we've got sort of the lower jaw of the, probably the shrew that we found just, just back then. It gives you an idea of the size of these things. We also have the leg of a beetle, which is up. So obviously this is this particular bird has been feeding on insects as well as small mammals from time to time. There's another sort of leg as well. So it's I you know it's probably advisable to group all the bones according to where they come from the animal. So you have a, a pile of limb bones, a pile of ribs. Well, this is sort of another limb bone. So you can sort of put that in, in your pile, and then you can just sort of Leave sort through them afterwards once you've decided you want to identify them or not. There's another limb bone. And we also have a pelvis, which you can actually sex small mammals depending on the shape of the pelvis. So there is actually information in the various guides on how to do that. So sort of. And we have a bit more of the a bit more of beetle. So basically it's just a matter of going through the pellet and deciding how much of it is useful, how much you want to keep. But but mainly just aim to extract as many of the skulls as you can. Because that's that's where the most in, important data is that's that's the only way you're going to get a better a, a decent picture of what the owls have been feeding on so 
So again, we have another We have another sort of small rab, small mount, rodent skull, which you can always, the easiest way to tell a rodent is they've got the yellow enamel on the incise, in the incisors on the, both the upper and lower jaw. So we can dis, work out whether that's like to be a vole or a mouse at, at a later date. And there's another small rodent. So so from what we can see, it looks like this pellet contains two skulls of a small so small rodents and one shrew skull. So it's just then a matter of going through identifying what we found. I say Magnifying glass is very useful for sort of looking at the, very, the various details of the bones you've got. You can also use one of these plug-in USB microscopes. I find that sort of quite useful. You can sort of magnify it on your laptop and actually take images of it as well at the same time. So that's always useful to have. Something else that can be quite useful, tea strainer. Put the bones in here and just run them under the tap. It tends to get rid of most of the extraneous fur which you don't want and then if you want to keep them then a supply of plastic tubes and you can then build up your own reference collection which you can use for any further you know owl pellet dissections you'd like to do so one advantage i have is that i used to work at a museum which had a large natural history collection so i used to be able to sort of take any bones i wasn't sure of to, and use their reference collection to identify them. I'll say that's that's a sort of brief demonstration of the crude way of going through an owl palace. As I say, you can actually soak them for a couple of hours before you dissect them, which does stop the bits of dust and what have you getting everywhere. But I say this is the, qu the quick, easy way. So what now we've sort of dissected our pellet, you'll want to know what's in there. So I'll just to share the screen again. And this is this is just a Brief introduction for, to the bones you're likely to find in our pellets. The easiest thing to start with is work out, is it, is it the skull of a rodent or is it the skull of an insectivore? Insectivores, such as this shrew here, have a continuous row of teeth. Basically, the idea, they're meant to be sort of used for crunching through hard skeletons of insects and worms and any other small invertebrates. So basically you're talking there shrews, shrews, mole and bats. Whereas if there's a gap between the insectivores, the, ins the front teeth and the teeth here, this is called a diastema. Basically it's, it'll be a rodent. It'll be one of them, either a mouse, a vole or a rat. All of those you can find sort of, in our pellets. You see the, the T, the skull here is designed for sort of gnawing through vegetation. You'll see that the tooth of a rodent has this orange enamel on the outer surface. You often find that the inner surface of the tooth will actually wear down over time. So it will actually give a slightly pointed appearance as the animal gets older. One, th one feature when you're looking for di to identify shrews is you'll find that they don't have something called a zygomatic arch, which basically is this structure here on this skull. You see it's absent from the skull, the shrew skull here. So that's an easy way to sort of tell a shrew from most other 
small mammals. The most likely one you like to find is common shrew. It's about two centimeters long, and as with all shrews, it's the skull is pointed towards the tip. The teeth are red tipped. Now, what you're looking for to work out the different shrews, if you look, is the number of what we call the tooth between the the, cane, the incisors and canines here and the molars at this point. And these are, you see, these are a row of pointed to teeth. These are described as unicuspid. And the number of these teeth can be used for identifying the different species. You will actually find with practice that you can actually identify shrews according to the size. Fortunately, all our the three native shrews are different sizes and so the skulls are obviously different sizes as well. I say these are common in the prey of virtually almost all our owl species, so you will come across them fairly regularly. You also find, if you look at the lower incisor here, there's a, a cusp just about there, which is distinctive. And if you, you can't really see it, well, you obviously can't see it on this image, but if you look at the vertical inside surface of the lower jaw, you'll find a sort of pyramid-shaped cavity, which is distinctive to this species. I say the jaw itself is about, the skull itself is about two centimetres long. And the, the length of the upper tooth row, which is this bit here, is generally about eight millimetres long or thereabouts. That can be a useful pointer in de you know, determining one species from the next. Obviously, just be aware that this this is obviously a relatively young animal because it's got plenty of in the red-tipped enamel on its teeth. These actually will wear away with time. So you can eventually you might see just very small spots of enamel. On the teeth, so it's just be aware, you know, aware of that. The smallest shrew, pygmy shrew, is about 15 to 16 millimeters long. Again, it's the skull's pointed with red tipped teeth, and it has five unique cuspid teeth behind the incisors. It's fairly common as prey, but it's often easily missed due to its small size, and you very rarely find these skulls complete because they're sort of very fragile. As with the common shrew, the inside of the lower jaw has a sort of has a dome-shaped cavity, so that's characteristic for this species. But again, the size of the the, the skull will sort of obviously be the most important feature if you work, you, know, you can work work it out eventually if you have a bit, bit of practice. The water shrew obviously is the largest of our species. This only has four unicuspid teeth behind the sort of the incisors, but the, one of the, mo the most dis two distinctive features of a water shrew skull. The, 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 if you look at the lower incisors, they're sort of small, they're sort of blade-like, they're sort of long and pointed and smooth. And you also note that the sort of shape of the skull is quite concave, whereas the pygmy and common shrew are relatively flat. So they, they're sort of features to look out for for this species. But again, it's usually the size should give it away. So you won't get a sort of common shrew skull any any length, any bigger than about two centimetres. These are very rare in scout owl pellets, probably because of the, the habitat they operate in. And this is your greater white tooth shrew. Not many sort of images of this, unfortunately, but this is one that was sent into the society. It's about two centimeters long, but as you can see, there is no red enamel on any of the teeth. And you, you see this sort of upper incisor is obviously hooked with this small cusp at the base, and the lower incisor is long and as blade like, as in the water shrew. I say it's not so if you find a shrew with obviously obvious white teeth, then that's what we're looking for. You will occasionally get mole skulls in sort of owl pellets, not very often, but you will get them found, found sort of later in the year when you get juvenile moles moving on the dispersing and they're sort of above ground. So you can sort of get them occasionally. 
They're much larger than shrooms, anything that's about three or four centimeters long. And obviously, the sort of the shape's different as well. There's up this, the long, thin with this. Then you can see there's that zygomatic arch here, which is missing in the shrooms, and they've got this very sort of bulbous rear end. So basically, I say these are very sort of common, and the ones you do get are sort of generally juveniles. Occasionally, you will come across bats. These tend to be short squat skulls and with very obvious and large incisors and white teeth. So they are, they are pretty rare, but you do come across them from time to time. Unfortunately, a lot of bat skulls tend to be very similar in size and shape. So you can't really identify a lot of them. Although the greater the two horseshoe bats. If you look at them, they do have this these ex, this extra bulbous structure on the skull. Basically, that's where they produce ultrasound. So you can actually identify those, obviously, based by size, basically. The sort of greater horseshoe bat is quite large, is obviously the larger of the two. For other bats, you probably have to sort of just leave it at record it as a bat species unless you've got access to a suitable reference collection. So these specimens, most of the specimens in the presentation were from photographed at World Museum Liverpool from their collection. So if you can have access to a museum collection, then it's really helpful. As far as rodents concerned, the one you're most likely to find is the field vole, especially sort of if you're looking through barn owl pellets, because barn owls hunt in open country, which is the prime habitat of field voles. You see, it's quite a could be quite a large skull over sort of three point two centimeters long at, the, at its biggest. You find that if you look at it, the interorbital region here is quite narrow compared to the other, to other other voles. And if you look at basically what you're looking for is the shape of the tooth. If you look if you look at it under a magnifying glass or a microscope, you'll find that the cheek teeth have a series of very sharp alternating triangles. It's sort of a zigzag shape. And they're they're actually pointed, whereas if you look at the bank vole, the zigzag shape to sort of rounded at the tips. Another way to sort of work out, distinguish between the voles is to actually extract some of the cheek teeth. In a field vole, you'll see that the cheek teeth have ridges all the way down the sides of the tooth, and unlike mice and other rodents, the teeth of the these teeth have no roots. If you look at the sort of lower jaw where a tooth has come from, it's just an open, open cavity. So this is the sort of commonest prey species of most owls, apart from the tawny and the little owl. And, obviously, and again, for most birds of prey, it'll be the main prey species. Bank vole is slightly smaller. The sizes are often sort of narrower and slightly weaker than the field vole. It's, a smaller animal altogether. The loops of the zigzag are, zags are rounded, as we, as we mentioned. But obviously, that's sort of you need to look, look at that under a, mag, a hand lens or a magnifying glass. If you remove the, the sort of cheek teeth, you'll find that each one has two root, two roots into it. So that's an obvious way to distinguish between the fetal fold. And also the cheek, the ridges on the teeth, cheek teeth of bank voles don't go all the way down. They sort of stop part way down the tooth. So they're the two, some of the features you need, need to look at from, to distinguish the two vole species. Because bank voles spend most of the time in woodland, they tend to be very, found much less in owl pellets than the field vole. I mean, you're more likely to find these in tawny owl pellets than most other species. The water vole you, does occur occasionally. It's basically very similar to the field vole, but a lot larger. Its cheek teeth, again, have ridges all the way down to the tooth. But you should be able to tell this on size alone. It's you know usually th at least three centimetres in length, coming up to three or four. And you can also see occasionally, you, you might be able to just make out that there's a slight ridge to the top of the skull, a sort of sagittal sagittal crest, as like that sort of thing, structure you find in a badger. 
The upper incisors are large and deep with sort of yellow colour on the anterior surface. As with the field voles, the mol molars don't have any roots and they're sort of, say, it has a similar zigzag pattern to the field and bank voles. So you generally won't find this in, in our pellets very often, but you, you do get the occasional juvenile from time to time. Woodmouse, mice tend to be sort of slight, lightly built skulls. The brain case is he's very smooth and oval, and there's a very, very slender zygomatic arch, which is often sort of broken in these species if you when you've sort of found them in pellets. The diadema is quite long in, in these species, and the tooth row is relatively short. It's about half the length of this distance here. Unlike sort of voles, mouse teeth have roots of in varying numbers. The first upper molar has four in this species, and the lower has, and the, the next two have two. So if you remove the teeth in the upper jaw, you should find there are eight root holes noticeable. The lower jaw is sort of, sorry, the upper jaw has 11 root holes and the lower jaw has six. Just be aware that if you live in the sort of Midlands and south of the country, you might get a sort of yellow neck mouse in sort of ear pellets. These can be only be tell, differentiated by size. They're sort of very, very similar in shape and form to the wood mouse. Being, the, being from the same genus, it's sort of very diff difficult to tell these things apart. Okay, the wood mouse is probably the second most common species you're likely to get in our pellets, whereas a house mouse is probably very, very uncommon because it tends not to go out outdoors very often. You'll see that on a house mouse, it's more or less, it's slightly smaller than the wood mouse and the brain case is depressed with a slightly but very poorly developed crest along the centre. The lower jaw is also shorter and much deeper than a wood mouse, it's sort of you know, a bit more compact. The upper jaw has eight root, root holes, if you take all the teeth, whereas the lower jaw has five. And it's sort of, I say, much less common. You'll also note, if you look at the upper incisor in these things, you'll find there's an obvious notch on the inside. So that's, I say, it's not a species you come across very often, but there's a the sort of features you can look for. Likewise, the harvest mouse. They will find sort of these things in our pellets, and occasionally, if there's a large population locally, you might find more, several skulls in a pellet. The small size of this animal is characteristic. It's never more than sort of twenty millimeters, two centimeters long. It's got a very short dia diastema between sort of the incisors and the cheek teeth and the cheek teeth of the row is very short it's less than sort of three millimeters long the skull is generally quite fragile so you very rarely find these things intact i say you, these are sort of locally common in large numbers in certain areas so don't be surprised if you will get sort of decent numbers of a reasonable number of harvest and ice in your sort of in your pellets Common rats, easily distinguished from the rest of the mouse, based basically just by its size. But you'll also note these, these two ridges that run along the sides of the cranium here, which sort of gives an angular appearance. It's distinguished by the what from the water vole, which is of similar size, because the molars have roots. The upper, the sort of, the upper jaw has 12 root holes, whereas the lower has 10. Whereas the water vole, the teeth, the cheek teeth don't have roots, so you just have the sort of open cavities. So the, 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 the incisors on this thing are, are quite broad and there's no obvious notch in them. So say, you will find occasionally these things in our pellets occasionally. It's usually juvenile animals and sort of, I would say not that often. Other species you might come across, weasel. 
say it's our smallest carnivore. So the skull is you know, about 40, just about 40 millimeters long. It's generally, it's quite robust and it's easily identified by its large size and it's sort of very distinct and sharp cusped cheek teeth and incisors and cane, the sh sharp incisors and canines. You also got the very large brain case for these animals. I say you don't find them very often, but you might find sort of the odd juvenile animal occasionally. And this is just a mixture of some of the other animal, but mammal bones you're likely to come across in, your, in pellets if you're looking to sort of build up a sort of reference collection. You see, you'll find lots of limb bones. These are sort of from the low the hind limbs, the humerus. These are sort of forearm, four limb bones. So ribs, you'll find lots of these of varying sizes. You have the, the scapula or the shoulder blades. They're pretty easy to tell apart. They're just flanned and triangular in shape. And then the, you'll get lots of pelvic bones and lots and lots of small vertebrae and various bits from the backs of the skull. Obviously, sort of, if the skull's been damaged when the the prey, the animal's been caught by an owl, then all usually the ear sort of. The sort of back of the skull where the ears are often sort of can become detached. You can also bang bits of plate, bits of bone from the back of the skull removed as well. So, so these are the things you sort of can sort of try and identify or tr just to practice. Sometimes you can get see people who actually reconstruct the entire skeleton from sort of taking out all these bones. It's quite an interesting exercise if you've got lots of patients. Birds are a sort of favourite prey item for certain owls, especially tawnies at certain times of the year. Unfortunately, a lot of bird skulls tend not to be intact in owl pellets. You tend to get the bill and sort of just the fore part of the skull. Some of them, like the starling, can be quite di distinctive because of the size, but the rest, like sort of blue tits, house sparrows, because they're lots of birds of similar size with similar shaped bill, bills and skulls, then you probably need a reference collection to determine what they are if you want to go that far. You'll also find bits of frogs as well and bits of insects, as we've seen. So you sort of can find sort of quite a variety of bones from various vertebrates. And obviously, you want to know where to go to look for you to identify these species. These are some of the ones that are available. There's an introduction to our barn owl pellets, which is available on the sort of, on the Mammal Society website. This is a sort of entry level, if you like. It's an introdu introduction, which you can sort of download, but there's also a sort of the advanced level, so to speak. This is about 40, this is 40 pages of sort of how to identify various Bones and various close ups of bits of the skull and what have you, with all the various details what to look for. I wouldn't recommend printing it off like I have. It goes through quite a lot of blank ink cartridges, but it is available to download and stuff. Hopefully, we'll like, like at some point, we might get it as available as a proper publication. Other, other publications available are. The analysis of barn owl pellets by the late Derek Yaldon, which has been a, a Mammal Society publication for sort of a number of years. And there's a guide to British owls and owl pellets, which is available from the Field Studies Council, which has got a lot of useful information. So there's lots of information out there to help you identify your pellets. And hopefully, once you've done that, you can send us the records either through Mammal Mapper or through your local record centre or whatever. Just be aware that because owls tend to wander around a bit when they're out hunting, they might visit more than one site, they might visit more than one county or more than one country. It's best to, if you do send look, your data in, make sure the location is where the owl pellets are actually found and make sure that's sort of mentioned in the comments maybe. You know, that's, that's sort of, you know, that'll be more informa valuable information to the county recorder and for the society rather than just leaving it blank. So with that, I'll sort of
stop daring and I think is it question time I presume brilliant thank you Tony um I'm just going to go through a couple of little bits about uh safety and um doing our pellet dissections with schools and groups and then we will go on to questions I can see there's a few questions in the chat already so thank you everybody for popping those in um so our pellet dissections are a really great activity for you to do with schools or with youth groups. Um, so these safety guidelines are kind of targeted at that audience, but obviously they're useful for everybody to know as well. So if you receive owl pellets from the Mammal Society, they will have already been frozen and heat treated. But if you're getting them from elsewhere, if you've got a supply yourself or if you come across some and you want to dissect them, <clears throat> what we recommend is that you pop them in the freezer for 24 hours and then you wrap those owl pellets in foil um, and heat them in the oven at 150 degrees for four hours. And that just means that there will be no live insect larvae or parasites present in the pellets. Um, we will warn you know, that it does smell a little bit when you are baking those owl pellets, so just bear that in mind. Um, and then once you've done that, it's still really useful to think of them as biological material and sort of treat them like they're still biological material. So. Uh, if you're working with young people, it's important to remind them um, about kind of scientific good practice. So things like keeping your hands away from your face, having a clear workstation and um, not consuming any food whilst you're doing the, the owl pellet dissection. And it's a really good opportunity just to teach those kind of lessons. Um, and the other one is about really good hand washing. You can wear gloves for the, the dissection if you want to. Um, we don't stipulate that that's something you have to do but just make sure you do a good hand wash after. And I'm, I'm not gonna talk you through how to wash your hands, but just make sure if you're working with young people that they are aware of how to do a really good hand wash. Um, and then after you've done the activity, you can get rid of all of the bits of the owl pellet that you don't need anymore um, and any disposable materials. So if you've used a cocktail stick to, to do the dissection, all of that can just go straight in the bin. Um, if you want to keep the bones, Tony did show you a, a specimen jar. So if you want to pop them in one of those and you can keep it sealed, but it's quite important if you're working with young people that they don't all go away with a pocket full of bones and skulls that they found, you can give them a different way to display them. Um, and it's really important when they are doing the dissection that you keep to those specific tools that are being used for that because then they can be cleaned afterwards. So make sure that their own like pens and pencils are away and they're not tempted to poke away at the owl pellets with those. Uh, and then all of your tools, if they're if you're not using something that's going to be binned, you can clean those with just a normal kind of bactericide or viricide or cleaning agent. And the same for the, the workspace where you're working, just give that a good wipe down afterwards as well. And that just means that you you kind of kept everything double safe for, for the young people you're working with. And then just before we go into questions, I just wanted to, to come back to um, the volunteer pack that Ross mentioned and all of the things that are available on the website. So the safety guidelines I've just talked through are available as a PDF and there's a lot more detail in all of those. So you can read through all of that as well. And then one of the things you'll receive um, will be a link to this flow chart, which just helps you make the decisions about what uh, you're identifying and how to identify it. So it's quite a helpful prompt. And if you're doing this with a group, it's a really useful thing you could pop up on a screen in front of them. Uh, and you also get this workstation that you might want to print out or you might want to just recreate on a blank piece of paper. So as you saw when Tony was dissecting the pellet, the way that he separated things out, you can just use this worksheet to help you separate those things out as well. And then the most important thing that you will receive um, when you order pellets is a link to the uh, recording sheet, the spreadsheet for you to send all of your data back in. Um, and if you're using your own owl pellets, you can find that on the website um, where you can make sure that we know the location and all of the important information for that as well. And that is the bit that Ross will be desperate to make sure you, you get right as well so that we get all of that information and it's all really usable for us. Okay, so that is everything from me now. So if you've got questions, please do keep popping them in the Q&A feature uh, and we will start to answer those now. So there's a question here that I think, I'm not sure, Tony or Ross, you might be able to answer. So it's talking about the location data with the pellets. If the pellets are found near roost sites, how far away from their feeding ground could that data be? How accurate are we in, in knowing what's around in that area? Um, 
it varies depending on the season, which is a which is a bit of a pain. Um, but we should um, I I I believe we will have data on on when the pellets were collected as well as the location. So um, in the summer, um, when the um, the you know the the prey the, the the prey species the food is is more available, the um the barn owls don't necessarily go as far, and I think there's kind of estimates that they'll go around. Um, it will be roughly a, a a kilometer radius circle around their their kind of nesting nest nest around their nest. Um, but then in winter, when food is scarcer, it could be it could be quite a lot further than that. Um, so that's all kind of that that make that does add a bit of complexity to um to the analysis and and it also it also introduces a little bit of kind of uncertainty about exactly where um the uh, the shrews were present um but I think you know this is this is this is the sorts of things that we that we that will we kind of have to sort out um do a bit of maths and a bit of kind of um you know um the confidence building there may be kind of overlaps with different um with different nest boxes as well that kind of triangulate where we find the species and things like that so um yes bit bit difficult but hopefully the um the kind of analysis that we do on the data will will help kind of mitigate mitigate those um those problems brilliant thank you ross and there was a question earlier about where we've found greater white tooth shrew so far could you just run us through where where we're expecting them yeah well i mean we've got the the first one was in sunderland um in uh you know just just south of of newcastle um and then there have been about 10 records around nottingham which is quite a quite far away so you know it's it's possible that the that the shrew exists or um in in far more places than we than we think it does at the moment and it's actually expanded fairly fairly widely um, but it's data deficient at the moment. Um, so we're just we're just not sure. And is the greater white tooth shrew classified as invasive non-native? And does that mean that it should be destroyed and not released if it was captured in mammal traps and that kind of thing? Um, as far as I know, it's it's it well, it's certainly non-native, um, but I don't think it's been classified as invasive yet. And I think again, that's because it's data it's data deficient. Um, we just it's just it's 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 not known how how far they range and and how how abundant they are. So we can't really say for sure how how successful they're being um, and whether or not they're kind of you know creating a a, a foothold um, and and a kind of a, a constant presence. But if it is the case that um, they've managed to kind of expand between Nottingham and Sunderland, then there's a good chance that there's quite a large, you know, a fairly large population. It'd be, it'd be interesting to see um, how big it really is. Um, and if that's the case, then then it potentially could be classified as an invasive um, once we once we know the answer to that question. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I was, sorry. I was speaking to somebody from the Animal Plant Health Authority from the, at the last conference and he seemed to think that you shouldn't release them well then again he didn't actually say what you do with them if you have caught them so i think it depends on who you ask at the moment <laughs> uh, um so another question for ross sorry ross you're getting all the questions <laughs> how long do we expect this study to go on for and when will we start yeah. the results well, um, I mean, so we've been receiving loads of of pellets now, um, uh, and we're 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 trying to send them out as quickly as we can to get them dissected um, to get the people involved. Um, so I think you know we we'd probably be in a place to 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 start kind of you know really kind of intensively looking at the data in in the next month or two. I think um, it depends on how things go, um, uh, but. I mean, the 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 thing is, is is the, the the as data comes in from more places across more time, um, we'll get a much better idea of 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 how things are. So I think um, it would be difficult for us necessarily to produce any kind of um, really kind of uh, um, what's the word um, strong inferences. Um, for a while, but perhaps um, 
you know, given. Um, and the question really was asking how long was this project going to be going on for, wasn't it, Joan? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't think we really have an answer for that at the moment because we're not sure how long it's going to take to get to the point where we've answered these questions. Um, and and of course, there's also the case that this um it was possible that this species could could kind of we could want if we do get a really good idea of where it is now, um, and we want to keep tracking it, then then it could be something that carries on for quite a long time, um, to kind of keep keep track of things. So um. I guess there's also quite a lot of potential just for monitoring other small mammals yes. with this method, isn't there? And there's a little bit yeah. of research going on into how kind of usable that is as a method as opposed to trapping yeah. or using. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, even even if um even if they find that or we, you know, everybody sort of prefers trapping as as a method to this, um, I don't think there's any reason why why this method couldn't continue alongside trapping as well, just to kind of um, add to the add to the data set. So if it were up to me, I think um, I think this we carry on for as long as possible, for you, and, until people, um, you know, but I, I, yeah, years and years, just to monitor. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and then there's a question about returning bones to the mammal society. Um, do they need to send in? specimens if we think it's a greater white tooth shrew or is that we'd like you to send pictures um yeah pictures would be fantastic um if you can get pictures of the teeth that would be great and also pictures with something to um indicate the scale as well that would be fantastic um i think you know i i you know i don't really think the mammal society has a great need for for skulls but I think, you know, I mean, we do do kind of outreach things at schools and, and it is nice to have some specimens on hand for things like that. Um, so um, if you'd like to send one in, we do have the free post address that you can send it into, um, which I'll put in the chat. Um, so, yeah, yeah, no need to. But uh, if you do want to send it, then we'd appreciate it. That'd be nice. Yeah. So if you find something that you know, seems like a brilliant specimen and you'd like to go it to go to good use, you can send it in. But no, we just need your data on the, the data sheets. Um, so there's a few little questions just about kind of logistics and that kind of thing. So some of you might have already received owl pellets and when you receive them, you should get an email about the same time that gives you all the links to the volunteer pack and gives you your uh, site ID code for them and all of that kind of information. Um, and then I've just seen somebody who's who's got a supply of their own barn owl pellets and they've got 30 in their freezer, which is quite a, an impressive accolade. So you can find all of that information on the volunteer resource as well. Um, so if you have a look on our website, you should be able to find all of that in the recording sheets as well. But I will pop a link to that in the chat too. And I can't see any other unanswered questions. So I will just give you a couple of minutes to keep popping questions in if there's anything you um, still want to know. Somebody's asking about a risk assessment for schools, is that? Yes, so we've got some safety guidelines. We haven't got it as a kind of full risk assessment template, but if that is something you need and you need some support with, um, do drop us an email and I can help with that. And there were a couple of useful um, comments from Rick. So Rick mentioned that if you want to preserve bones, um, a hydrogen peroxide solution is quite good for cleaning them up, um, but not degrading the bone. And he also mentioned that it's probably quite useful if you're thinking that you've got a greater white tooth shrew, if you send that one into the Mammal Society, because then we can um, just double check that ID as it yeah, can be quite hard to identify sometimes. And is there a limit to how many pellets you can supply? So we have been completely overwhelmed by the number of people wanting pellets. So there isn't a limit. Um, and if you're looking to do this like with a group or you, you need quite a lot of pellets, that's absolutely fine. But it might take a little bit longer for us to get them to you. Um, so at the moment, what we're doing is we're sending out 
in chronological order and particularly the smaller requests so that we can get the most out to the most people. Um, but yeah, do do pop a request in for what you need and we can always come back to you and say um, that we you know, can't supply that many. And um, sometimes it's quite difficult because we don't have big batches from one specific site and then it gets a little bit confusing with ID codes, but we can sort that all out as well. Um, and then somebody else is asking just what you need to do to participate. So if you go to the website, you can click on the request appellate form. Um, or if you know somewhere where you can get hold of our pellets yourself, you can just start there and use all of the website resources to get going. And so all of those resources, when you receive your pellets, should come through to your email address that you signed up for. Uh, and yet, and you can request again and again if you've you've completed your five or ten or however many you requested and you want to go again, that's absolutely fine. And somebody's yeah. asking, can you autoclave our pellets? Yeah, um, I'm not sure on that one. That is one for us to look up and, and get back to you on. Um, I guess if you're you're heating it at, you know, a low enough temperature, like around 150 degree mark, that should be fine. Um, we're currently processing them in a, a small oven in our CEO shed at the moment, so... So if you've got your own pellets, you don't need to register. Just make sure that you're sending us the data on, on the spreadsheet that you'll find on the website. Um, I, I, uh, there's a question about the free post address. I, I think I, I popped it in the chat, but it's only gone to the hosts and panelists. Um, um, ah. I don't have the option to send it to everyone. So if, um, I wondered if you could copy and paste that, Fiona. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. There we go. There it is. And if you look back in the chat, you'll also see the link for the Searching for Shrews page and for all of the Owl Pellet resources as well. And I've just popped my email in the chat as well. So if you've got specific questions about schools or um, doing this with, with young people, um, particularly the person that was asking about risk assessment, I can... Uh, help you if you drop me an email brilliant ah there's a question ross you might know the answer to this so if somebody was to use iNaturalist do we still get that um data through if it's on there and not on mammal mapper um so it won't go through our kind of databases directly um, I, 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 you know, I'm not sure if it ends up on the NBN, and if it does, it should be it should be available for us to to get a hold of. I think, in my experience, once it's verified, it'll go on the NBN. Yeah. So it depends on what part of the country and how active your verifier is in that <laughs> neck of the woods. So I, as I verify records in this area. We get quite a few, well, a few iNaturalist records most months. So once they're verified, they're just treated as a I record record, so to speak. But for specifically for this project, just handy if it comes in on the recording sheet. Ross, yeah, yeah, that would be nice. It's it's ju it's just really for a kind of a, um. You know, if everything's in the same format, it's a lot easier to join it all together because we're going to have it coming from so so many different sources. Um, just kind of managing it when it's in the same shape is a, is a bit is a bit easier. And I would appreciate I would appreciate that. But but that's not to say you know if if you do find other other recording um, schemes easier to use or if you already use them and you're used to them, that's absolutely fine. There's no reason to. Um, to um you know to change just 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 for this brilliant well thank you everybody for joining us thank you ross and thank you tony uh, and i hope everybody feels ready to go and dissect some owl pellets
Okay, we'll leave it there. I hope you all have a good rest of your evening.